Ladies and gentlemen, back with me again, Natasha Kravis. How's your experience through the plenary 9 and 10? We hope you get a lot of useful knowledge from the previous plenaries. And now we would like to invite Professor Ojat Darujat, PhD, Rector of Open University of Indonesia, to give us the keynote speech. Please welcome Mr. Ojat Darujat, PhD. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Ceremonial, uh, and good morning, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, so, uh, before I present my slides, uh, let me first express my gratitude and thank you to the President of ISODEL uh, 2021, Dr. Hassan Habibi, for inviting me to be the speaker in this uh, webinar. My session would be uh, focused on the Universal Terbuka Rule in providing flexible uh, learning for all citizens, especially Indonesian citizens. Uh, let me share my slide. <clears throat> okay. Uh, UT or Universe Terbuka established in uh, 1984. It's a single mode university and the only uh, institutions using exclusively distant education mode of delivery in uh, our country, in Indonesia. And uh, what they mandate is to provide equal access to quality higher education through open and distant learning. So from the beginning, what they has uh, been designed by the Indonesian government for nurturing three original missions. First, providing equal access to higher education for all Indonesians, uh, spreading out all over the country. And secondly, providing for the degree and qualification for uh, working people. It's like uh, a scaling, upscaling, professional development program. So, and order to do so, UT strictly implements affordable tuition fees for all students and employs uh, flexible learning delivery. Our university provides educational services which include academic, administrative, and learning support services for its students. The service can be accessed through a certain nine regional offices spread out all over the countries uh, to serve students who live in 514 districts, cities, or we call it kabupaten kota in Indonesia of the total of um, 515 district or cities in Indonesia and uh, one of our student service center to serve student in uh, 50 countries. And besides that, they also has a service point, a service point access, we call it SALUT or Center Layan UT. SALUT is a representative for UT technical services in district and towns. It's under the coordination and supervision of our UT regional uh, offices. This is our students, student body. This figure describes the average number of students uh, registered in uh, from uh, 2011 until 2021, as you can see here. Uh, in 2021, the number of registered students was uh, more than uh, 300,000 students. Uh, so it means that the number of registered students is increasing. However, there is an interesting shift of student demography. After 2016, the age of our OT students tends to be younger, meaning that more uh, high school fresh graduate enroll as a UT student. Uh, in this digital era, 
integrating technology into education it has been a vital part of teaching and learning. And this is uh, my supervisor when I uh, took my uh, PhD in Canada, David Goldman. Uh, he said that the marriage of computers with communications technology has provided a significant impact on developing and delivering learning materials in various instructional modes. The delivery modes of instructions in distant education have been changed from paper-based and correspondence study to web-based instruction and other kind of online learning programs that leads to the possibilities of virtual learning environment. The importance of technology in education is also enforced by our former uh, Minister of Education, Muhammad Nasir, and Mas Nadima Karim, the Minister of Education at the moment, as you can see here in our slides. <clears throat> However, according to Michael Crow, the President of Arizona State University, one of the main concern in integrating technology into education is the lack of congruence between the speed with which technology is advancing and the speed with which academy like us, uh, faculty members or university is able to advance. Whereas there is a lack of compatibility between pedagogical evolution and technology evolutions. Therefore, there are some important points to be considered for the integration of technology to be successful in our uh, internal process. The first one, the integration of academic and circular planning with faculty development. Secondly, high quality ongoing and sustainable faculty development, uh, for example, in technology, pedagogy, and internal design that support learning and uh, access to appropriate tools and resources. Faculty involvement that gives faculty a reasonable ownership of choice, design, and the environment, and then demonstration of institutional commitment uh, to the support of faculty who are uh, taking difficult steps to engage technology and embrace innovation in change. Uh, as you know that in uh, there are many uh, senior faculty member uh, tends to be uh, resisted about the use of uh, technology. And also it is very important, visionary transversal leadership, something like in university, uh, rector, vice rector, and uh, how to uh, employ to integrate technology in our institutional process. So referring to the Ministry of Education and Culture statement and concerning situation in Indonesia today, we can see that COVID-19 outbreak has pushed all universities moving forward from face-to-face -to, -face to hybrid and even fully online as their major learning delivery modes. According to our experience in uh, Universitas Buka, there are some different benefits by employing uh, online learning program as one of the learning delivery modes. Firstly, increasing student participation, as you can see in the figure that currently Indonesian students are more than uh, 3,000 students. So widening students' uh, teacher interaction, this is a, a student engagement. Uh, also promoting student engagement. So student engagement can be promoted for uh, seven 24 hours. Uh, moreover, in response to the ongoing changes and advances in the digital technology, UT determined to create human resources through the digital learning ecosystem, both in academic and non-academic services. Through this step, it is hoped that top quality human resources development will be obtained. And in addition, the digital learning ecosystem is also expected to be useful or other universities to the use of UT's uh, online learning platform. UT has developed enterprise architecture, which is used as a reference for preparing long-term plans and organizational roadmap in the future. 
OT has developed enterprise architecture. Uh, OT transformation as a digital learning ecosystem is in line with the mandate of the president of the WWE Indonesia delivered as UT uh, 37 anniversary to achieve digital learning and edutech institutions. <clears throat> Online learning in UT has been considered as an institutional delivery through the use of internet to facilitate students' ability to access learning materials, interact with content, instructor, and other learners, and to obtain support during the learning process. In our online learning services, we develop a synchronous and asynchronous platform to support student learning or asynchronous interactions. We use Microsoft Teams platform. Uh, for asynchronous academic services, we use a uh, Moodle platform. We also use different learning support services, such as developing printed and non-printed learning materials. We develop internal book, digital library, digital learning materials, and others, such as uh, OT Television and uh, OT Radio. <clears throat> As an open university, UT also focus on how to optimize its capabilities in integrating technology to institutional deliveries, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic as follow. Providing virtual knowledge sharing forum yeah, <clears throat> uh, for students and public audience. During the pandemic uh, that has yet to elevate in Indonesia, it does not diminish the figure of the Civitas Academia of UT to continue to improve their understanding and dissemination of the knowledge of the system, technology, and management of distance learning program for all lectures, students, and public in general. It is proven with the convention of the UT Knowledge Sharing Forum uh, virtually in a webinar mode through Microsoft Teams covering uh, several topics regarding open, online, uh, distance learning, and broadcast on uh, UTTV. And then implementing different policies uh, for student assessments. In April 2020, UT issued a policy related to the implementation of the final semester exam. UT eliminates face-to-face uh, -face implementation of the final semester exams. So, UT issued a new policy, namely course assignment that were given to students who did not have access either to online tutorial or web-based tutorial. This policy got positive response from the regional offices and the students. Uh, the course assist, uh, assignment services provided for students who due to geographical and internet access constraints during the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Uh, were massively used by uh, more than uh, 500,000 students per course, will remain part of UT learning support for uh, uh, co post-COVID-19 pandemic. And then strengthening for providing internet access. As a pioneer of distance education in Indonesia, UT is one of the most visited public uh, universities in Indonesia other universities, both from within and outside the country, to conduct uh, comparative uh, studies on distance learning and e learning. And then transforming internal design, providing training for synchronous literacy skills for face to face tutorial of students, and uh, supporting uh, student engagement and flexibility. So, uh, lastly, this is the last uh, slide. To continue to improve the quality of open and distance learning, institution implementation, UT focus on making effort of the field of academic governance and uh, outreach. In the academic field, program diversification and acquisition are carried out to meet the demand of rapidly changing job, especially in the demand of the industrial revolutions. So we, uh, UT, uh, has developed various digital learning uh, pathway, including MOOCs, a training, a certificate program, and micro-credential. And currently, UT has been assigned by the ministry to develop a ICE Institute. ICE Institute is one of gallery, online gallery, 
of courses that can be taken and transferred by students using blockchain technology. It is an online learning center for many universities and online learning providers accredited by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology. And OT was chosen as the leader of consortium among the reputable universities in our country, such as University Indonesia, IPB, UGM, ITS, UNS, UNDIP, BINUS, and others. So the ICE Institute collaborates with edX in organizing uh, more than uh, 103,000 courses from uh, 55 international universities that are member of the MIT Harvard Consortium. And this is uh, the last slide. Uh, so uh, we come to the end of my presentation. I hope it would be valuable for enrich our knowledge and experiences in dealing with the digital era. Whereas the use of online technology must be increased to enlarge the accessibility and increase the quality of education. Whatever strategies will be used, it is necessary to pay an attention to the quality. High quality to online requires a good design for each material as well as uh, its education. That's all. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ojet Darojat, PhD, for the speech. And next, we would like to invite Professor George Siemens from University of Texas Arlington to give us the keynote speech. Please welcome Professor George Siemens. Hi all, um, my name is George Siemens and I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so uh, looking at what I think are some of the important areas of educational technology and educational technology innovation. Um, first, I'd like to say particularly thank you to the organizers of the event for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. I've had a chance over the last 15, 20 years to travel to many countries of the world, and uh, one that I have yet to visit is, is Indonesia. So I'm certainly hoping that uh, that's uh, an opportunity to visit in, in exists in, in the near future. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today specifically is the ways that we are starting to use technology as a, not a novel tool, uh, the way we've perhaps seen it in the past, but as sort of central to how we function in the education system. So in this regard, educational technology is just a normal part of what we do. And to get there, I want to start by setting a little bit of a background or a context around theories of learning. And I think it's important because when we take actions or make decisions uh, against the backdrop, there's always a type of a baseline that we're reflecting on. And that baseline is what are our opinions and our conceptual views that are informing and directing our decision making. And so in that regard, I'm going to present uh, connectivism, uh, which is a work that I did uh, about almost 20 years ago now, as a framework that helps guide academics and teachers and school officials and government agency uh, leaders uh, is a way of making decisions about the adoption and the use of educational technology. But let's step back and look a little bit at how did we get here? What's been happening with technology and learning in general? And I think we can say, broadly speaking, there's at least six distinct stages. And the last one is emerging quite quickly. Um, but six distinct stages that have shaped the use of technology in educational settings. So first was pre-web, and this was before I started teaching, actually, when it was more prominent. Some of you attending may still remember, but this was when we were using computer-based training. Uh, DVDs or laser discs would be used in the educational process, but quite often these tool sets were not connected to the Internet. Uh, everything was held locally, it was done on a computer, and individuals would learn and interact with those technologies sort of on their own. And there might be feedback or some level of adaptivity or even media that was included, but by and large, it was a uh, isolated sort of self-individual learning activity. It was supported by computers, but it wasn't really a significant tool set in terms of broader impact. Everything we know now about learning, the value of social interactions and social connectedness was missing from those kinds of learning approaches. But then we started seeing the early stages of the Internet. And this was probably in the late 1990s, early 2000s, where a number of tools like learning management systems such as Moodle, Blackboard or WebCT. Now many of us are probably using Canvas or a comparable tool set. But this is when they were first starting to come on. And much of the interest at this stage was to take existing 
curriculum and put it online. And we didn't really have a well-developed video infrastructure at that point. The bandwidth was still too limited, but this was at least an opportunity to gain access to people who were perhaps a little bit more remotely located or didn't have access to that school for whatever reason. Curriculum was still quite central and their experience of learning at least was still a lot like what happened in a classroom, which was the teacher was still the expert and did the lecturing. Then we came to an interesting time, and I think in many cases still one of the areas of the internet that I don't think we quite understand or that at least we, we still haven't fully absorbed as a society. And that was what's now called Web 2.0. And from a web 2.0 perspective it was basically just this idea of a read write web, which means anyone could create content and curriculum and publish it. And anyone would have the ability to make that available to others. And so you could engage with people, academics, peers from around the world and share these rich dynamic learning experiences. Another thing it added, which I think was probably the most consequential shift, was the inclusion of social learning and a focus on social interactions. And so in some ways, what happened here was the control of the learning experience shifted from the educator to the student. And as a consequence of that shift, there was a completely different way of interacting in classrooms. Classrooms became global. We had connections with colleagues from around the world. And we had students who could engage with experts rather than just read their papers, but they could directly interact with a professor and hear what she thought and how her thinking had evolved since the publication of a paper and so on. And there was a number of tools, some which are still prominent, some which are less so, uh, that were used or sort of incubated during this time and became quite popular. But I would say this is really the central point of the development of technology and education. And by central, I mean it marked the shift from the teacher as being the primary source of contribution to knowledge to the teacher being part of an overall network and students having a much greater voice. Then we entered a period, sort of at this point, we're, we're in uh, the mid to you know, probably closer to 2010, uh, 2012, where media-rich technology started. And YouTube, for example, was prominent. It was very easy for someone to create a video and upload it. Previously, bandwidth and storage had been the problem, and now it wasn't. Um, there's also the development of a number of open online courses, such as uh, MOOCs, edX, and related providers that really started having a dramatic impact on teaching and learning in general. There's also a number of other tool sets that really popularized learning and digital or interactive learning uh, resources such as Khan Academy, which have become and continue to remain very popular in, in a number of schools and often translate to a range of, of languages in different parts of the world. This stage was defined by integrated platforms that were fairly visual. So less than the traditional text-based interaction, this was much richer and much more dynamic. We then ended up in a series of stages that didn't reach full potential, and they may over time. Now we would likely call some of this the metaverse, uh, the uh, transition that Facebook is attempting to make, for example. But it's where there's game-based uh, integration between physical and virtual worlds, and we have a different dynamic of interacting with one another uh, that is a much potentially more um, more complex because it allows us to interact in a near real physical way, people who are from around the world because we're avatars interacting in meetings in different kinds of digital settings. One area, and this is a huge area of current interest for me is around artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence changes the learning process, supports teaching, supports students and so on. Again, this is still a bit of an early stage. A lot of it is uh, more hype than reality, but I think school leaders and university and government officials should be paying attention to how AI is evolving because I think it will have a significant effect, uh, you know, effect or an impact on teaching and learning in general. Now, there have been a number of other technologies I'm not going to get into. I know they're still continuing to develop and evolve. Just referencing br briefly things like blockchain or alternative credentials, uh, the move to cloud-based systems, profile management or advanced tools for uh, learning specific activities. These are important technologies and they'll continue to evolve, but they haven't necessarily quite had that integrative effect that some of the previous trends did have. And so what we have then is we have systems where because of technologies shifting some of the control from the teacher to the student, 
we have a situation where individuals have much greater control over their learning than they've ever had before. But this creates some problems because one of the benefits being a teacher, one of the benefits of having expertise is that you can provide direction and guidance to students so they don't have to make all of the same mistakes themselves. And so this is where we start to create a problem and we start to see knowledge fragmentation or probably the biggest issue, we have lack of coherence. If I learn a new concept from 10 different sources, I may not understand how all the pieces fit together. And that's exactly the nature of the problem that we're facing when we have situations where the units of education, which used to be courses or workshops or modules, are reduced to competencies, or instead of a full length of a course, someone can just go out and learn things on their own. We then end up with fragmentation. So what we lose in this move to digital technologies with everyone having a voice is we lose some of that coherence, how everything fits together, which is the role that experts have often played. So we have information fragmentation. The problem is with this fragmented content and conversations across the web, we need to pull them together so it's a meaningful whole. The meaningful whole is usually created by an expert, but now learners and individuals can create it on their own. What we have then are significant conceptual misunderstandings. Now, this isn't exclusive to the internet. There have been issues of conceptual misunderstandings arising in a range of different settings. And these different types of technologies are just going to uh, continue to accelerate what's already an existing trend. So here's one illustration, the illusion of explanatory depth, if you will, where uh, a, a psychology prof had a group of individuals draw what they thought a bike would look like, everyday devices, just to see if they understand how they fit together. And what they found is actually people don't know often how they fit together. There's big variations. And as a result of those variations, uh, people aren't understanding what we as educators think they're understanding. There's a number of problems that are arising. And these are conceptual problems, which come as a result of not having an expert correct the chain or the behavior of individuals. Another illustration is the MIT light bulb uh, study, which looked at graduates who aren't able to light or power a light bulb uh, with a battery wire and, and an actual energy store or a, a light bulb, I should say. This is something you would think individuals would understand or learn early on in their experience as students, but unfortunately it's not. It's much more complex than that. So we're faced with a problem where individuals have access to the world's knowledge, but they're misunderstanding how core pieces connect. Another example of this was a private universe, which was a video report done on uh, students one of those, you know, just misunderstanding core concepts in science, such as why we have seasons. And in this instance, what they found was students graduating from Harvard often were unable to explain why we have seasons. They thought it was distance from the between the earth and the sun when instead it was the tilt of the earth's axis. So we're seeing the same problem, conceptual misunderstanding. So now we've got two things asserted. One, that there has been an evolution of technology use and adoption over the last 20 years that has given learners greater control. But two, it's created a problem where learners who have greater control often aren't able to put together a coherent view of a particular topic. So there's a lot of errors and misinformation. Now, a number of theorists going back you know, over a century have tried to explain how learning and knowledge occurs. And so some would say, well, it's not just in your head. It happens across a network. We're intelligent with our friends. We're intelligent with our peers. And we solve problems in social systems. And Hutchins, Spivy, and Brider have all had this kind of a view. Others like Wittgenstein and Vygotsky similarly feel that it's not knowledge unless we externalize it or verbalize it in some way. Other theorists have emphasized socialization, sharing it and connecting with others and so on. So a number of years ago, I articulated that this view of learning so that we don't have these mistakes that happen when individuals have control of the technologies, I called it connectivism. And basically, it's the view that knowledge is networked and distributed. When we learn, what we're really doing is forming new neural connections, conceptual connections or external networks and connections with this information. This typically happens in spaces that are complex and rapidly changing. And more and more, these are influenced or aided by technology. And all four of these points are critical, but the fourth one is starting to become more and more relevant as technology, especially in the age of COVID, starts to become more prominent in our classrooms. So connectivism then is essentially a theory of learning and knowledge. And I'm suggesting in this regard that uh, knowledge is a network process 
And this can occur in a number of levels. Like it can be an individual, so I can learn in this way. A team or an organization can learn. And even an entire society or culture can similarly learn in this kind of a model or this kind of an approach. But it starts ultimately with three distinct levels of learning for an individual. So when I learn something new, I'm literally forming neural connections in my head. I'm putting pieces together, concepts uh, or neurons are firing and, and representing this knowledge in different ways at a biological level. But it's also conceptual. I'm understanding how pieces fit together. How can I, the MIT example, how can I light a light bulb without uh, understanding how wire and electricity and so on works? But more and more, it's happening externally. It's happening as part of a social system. It's happening as part of a technical system. So my argument then is that learning is networked and it happens at a neural, conceptual, and an external level. And there's a number of ways where individuals have talked about how cognitive processes such as uh, you know, thinking and neurons firing uh, are examples of distributed networks that occur across our biological brain or illustrations of memory that memories are primarily networked and we move these, we can navigate these networks of memories as we recall uh, different points. And ultimately this knowledge is held in a distributed system. It's not centrally located, say in a library. It's, it's, so it's bits and pieces are stored across these distributed networks. Other illustrations, which has advanced the idea that a, a network theory of human intelligence is more accurate than some of the existing theories that we have. So this view that you have this G or general intelligence and those variations are essentially, um, you know, rather than a traditional hierarchical model, they're expressed through networks and through connectivity. Others, especially from a neuroscience end, have said that these structures of brains are actually quite common to network models that we see in other spaces of society, such as global travel networks and so on, or networks that we see in, in food systems and ecosystems and, uh, and other types of, of environments that we see around us, either human created or ones that are in nature. They exhibit similar network type structures. And so these distributed knowledge systems, whether they're neuronal or otherwise, they also happen at a conceptual level. So in the way that a concept then, let's say a concept would be how to perform a certain kind of statistical analysis, the way that that's held in my head biologically, uh, namely it's stored in neurons and patterns and, and neurons that are distributed across the brain, activate the recall. When we take this as a concept and I try to communicate it to someone, I'm similarly navigating, I'm, I'm representing the neural basis at a conceptual level. And another illustration of this would be you know, Google's knowledge graph, which details human knowledge at this connected kind of a model. And then finally, and more prevalently now for most of us with the growth of technology is that these kinds of tools and technologies are now occurring at a very rapid pace through the development of artificial cognition or artificial agents that exist at really all aspects of society. And so we're now using our phones or the internet or search engines or our uh, digital network of peers, we're using that to build and activate knowledge. And so this is also influence. It's not just social systems. When I first wrote the paper on connectivism in 2004, um, you know, I mentioned that these agents can be human and non-human. And now I would argue that these systems are uh, increasingly non-human, that the knowledge networks that humans participate in are increasingly supported by artificial agents. Simple illustrations. You know, if you want to go out for dinner, we might use an app. Or if you want to find uh, you know, an answer to a question, you might use a, a Siri or a, an additional um, agent that you can just ask questions to and it'll give you an answer on your phone or on your laptop. So there's a number of ways where we as people are already relying on an artificial cognitive agent to help us make complex decisions. Now, here's the difference. And because I'm talking about, and that's the point of your conference in Indonesia, is you're looking at uh, how is educational technology the new normal? And so the question is, well, in what ways is artificial intelligence really any different from the other tools that we've used in the past? And I would say it's different because in the past, we've used a technology to do a job. We take an overhead projector or we take PowerPoint and we communicate what we want to communicate. Now, instead, these tools 
we they they're changing our actions. So instead of using the tools, the tools are also in a way starting to use us. And so they shape our behavior. They the automated algorithms give us access to certain kinds of information that we might not have had access to before. So they put us into sometimes these echo chambers, which can result in polarization of opinion and so on. So there's a lot of dynamics that that arise as a result of these tools and of these technologies. So they're agents that shape our behavior rather than tools that we use. Another way to look at it is we're in this world of human and machine distributed cognition. Algorithms, uh, robots are now a part of our cognitive system. As I mentioned, they're agents who think with us, not just agents or entities that we use to think. And so it's probably worth before, uh, you know, I, I move towards, uh, you know, a little too far along, but it's probably worth emphasizing and defining what cognition is. And I think cognition happens at three levels. It can be sensory processes where we have input of sounds or sights or touch and our neurons respond to that, those inputs. It can be mental operations, such as storing things in memory or interacting with ideas at a memory level, or it can be these complex integrated activities that are involved where we interact with information and ideas, and we talk about political things, we talk about religious things, we talk about human rights, and, and so on. So cognition then is these basic biological sensory processes these somewhat advanced mental memory related processes and these sophisticated complex integrated activities. Now that links well to what I stated early as the core ideas of connectivism. It's biological, conceptual and external. In regard to human cognition, we would say it's the brain at a biological level, the mind or the body or neurons. It could be ideas and agents and so on. So this three part model remains to be the central framework that shapes and guides my thinking about how we plan on using uh, technologies in educational settings. So how does this apply when it relates to online learning? And I know all of you are, have had a, a tumultuous almost two years now with the, with COVID and time at home or time in a laptop rather than a classroom. And that's made some big changes, but those changes are being accelerated. We would have gone a similar pathway, but slower because technology was growing in influence and impact and COVID really accelerated it. But it's already been happening. This idea that we move from these big centralized systems to network systems, or we move from a, a framework where we're built for stability, like traditional car manufacturers in the US, to now it's built for agility. How fast can you move and respond to new challenges? And it's also one where we are starting to see the effects in education settings. So rather than the teacher always being right or the curriculum being developed only by experts, we now have individuals that go out and build and develop and shape ideas continually. And that's a reality where a group of students can be in some cases more intelligent or produce better knowledge output than a solo, uh, solo expert. Now, one of the things that's unique, and I think this still remains a challenge in educational settings, and I'll use this word, what we miss in education is what I'll call a latency activating tool. So to put that into context, there was latent capacity in a house, meaning if you weren't at home and you had a house, then some, you know, somebody could live there, but no one was. Then a tool like Airbnb came by and it activated that latent capacity and allowed you to have somebody rent your house or the latent capacity of a car. Uh, you know, Uber made it possible for others to use or drive cars. And so the latent capacity of that car being used throughout the day is activated by these technologies. In education, we have a lot of latent capacity of individual people who know a lot of things, but they don't have the opportunity to share and to express it. And so we need those kinds of tool sets. And we've had them in a little glimpses, such as MOOCs or open online courses, or Twitter for social connection, but a more integrated view of how we pull all our knowledge pieces together and share is something that we're still waiting for. And this is a model of how it's traditionally been. The faculty or the teacher in K-12 has core content, they communicate it to the learner. Well, I think it should perhaps look 
a little bit more, um, you know, from a traditional course level, um, we should expand that. We should broaden that. You know, traditional course would have a textbook, a syllabus, guest speakers. You would work in a lab. And then that would be the accessible domain of knowledge, which is the scope of what you need to know as a person and in that course. But I think now we need something that looks more like this, where, yes, the faculty member is still important, but they're not the only part or the teacher isn't the only valuable part. There's a lot of peripheral and related resources available, content that's co-created, open education resources, experts from other uh, countries or regions that we can bring into our courses and so on. Or put another way, we take the curriculum and the resources and the material and we just break the walls that have existed in the past. And as I stated earlier, we attempt to activate the latent capacity of learners by asking them to create resources, to connect with one another and to share ideas. Typical view would be the top where you have well-designed learning, activities, assessment, and then a credential, and the bottom where you have networked social learning where you're actively engaged in creating a knowledge production. So the question then becomes, um, especially since you're looking at what is the new normal for teaching in digital settings and so on, and I'll say at a pretty fundamental level, what we've seen in the past is our school systems are, uh, or our full domain of learning and knowledge sits in daily sense making, which you and I might just do as we try to make sense of our world, who to vote for politically, um, you know, how to raise our children and so on. Then in the bottom left, you have mapping to existing knowledge. This is what universities and schools do. These are the spaces where we know things. We have created books on it. We've done special issues on it. And that's the domain. But then on your right hand side, we have crisis. This could be SARS or COVID now, a natural disaster, an economic collapse. Or the bottom right corner, we have new knowledge, things that are being created by individuals in a collective type of a way. And I would say in the past, with the old normal, we spent most of our educational practices in teaching students how to learn what we already know. But I think the future is in this domain. This is where all the future work will happen, which is how do we pull together pieces like when COVID starts? How do we solve that problem? How do we make sense of these challenges? Or where new research is generated, how do we take that new research and quickly move it into practice? Now, one way to start to do this is to, to begin to use learning analytics or data analytics more in the educational process. And this is where we have the knowledge of the individual student, which not, isn't just collected in a formal way in a classroom. It can be collected informally from just learning on your own, taking courses on the side, uh, attending lectures on YouTube and so on. But then we have this qualification is what is the architecture of knowledge in a discipline? And this is typically, this would be, let's say this is an introduction to statistics. That's the, the, we would look and break down each learning outcome and each point that they need to know. And that's still an important thing to do. But if we have students who learn from a range of different ways on their own, then we should be able to account their personal learning, not just their formal learning, when we access the degree of uh, competency that that student has acquired. So my argument then is that what we need to do is start building learner profiles so that we can identify what students have learned compare it to what a group of experts feel is important for people to learn, and then we can assign formal credit for both informal and formal learning as well. We tried this together with a colleague, Stephen Downs, a number of years ago, where we wanted to uh, look at, well, how can we, because we, we, we want to pull some of these fragmented pieces together. If people are learning all over the place, it's like I mentioned, what you lose is coherence. And so we want to pull these pieces together in a meaningful way. And so we took this idea where you'd have blogs or learning management systems, social media, and so on, and you would centrally aggregate it, filter it, and then provide a daily email newsletter uh, to individuals based on their interest or based on the kind of work that they're doing. These are still pretty simple models. And I just want to emphasize these two things, from my end at least, are quite consequential. So to go back, we're saying we want to recognize formal and informal learning in order to produce a, a, an assessment of what a student actually knows. But we need to build a technology infrastructure that allows us to account for a range of learning opportunities in a range of different settings, and then to be able to uh, assess the quality of a student's learning and to give them resources and materials back to those students based on the kind of learning that they most need. And I think that's increasingly going to be more the future of learning and learning systems.
Two quick final slides. One, I just want to mention, we just launched our Master of Science in Learning Analytics. It's a fully online learning analytics program at University of Texas in Arlington. Uh, we're doing enrollment for both January 2022 and also for August of 2022. So it may be the sort of thing that some of you might be interested in exploring. Finally, we have a free open and online event. It actually starts next week, Monday. It runs for three days. And we're looking at how artificial intelligence impacts learning processes. It's free registration and uh, you're welcome to join. Thank you for your, uh, your time listening. I am, as I've said, looking forward to future opportunities to visit uh, your beautiful country. And I applaud the organizers and the government leaders for uh, helping to create this uh, future-focused conference. I hope you're doing well, and I regret that I am not with you. All the best. Thank you, Professor George Seaman. Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue to our next agenda, we will have a short break. And hopefully we'll see you guys again after the break. Still on Israel Expo 2021.